you know, so the things that Gerard can do with a football, any pass off any surface, any foot, he can do it. Do you know what I mean? And then we also had people like Mario Balotelli as well, which is was an indication of someone who had all the talent, but there was something missing, like the, the mentality. Like it's dropped and then spanned back into the goal. And it was just like, who would even try that? Like, you can't even do that, like, do you know what I mean? And it was just what? one of them where you just stop and clap. Three two five eight here, back with another episode. Uh, this one with one of my nearest and dearest um, in in the game of football. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, share. Um, this one is an interesting one because we've known each other for a while now, and uh, he's had a illustrious journey and um, played for a lot of clubs, a lot of organisations, and. Uh, you know, he's a he's a good friend of mine in football, which is is kind of rare to come by nowadays. You know, sometimes, um, especially you play the same position. It's how we met, play for England. I played the same position, but it wasn't like, you know, oh, obviously there's competition. You know, he, we're playing the same position. We're trying to get one uh, spot in the team. But I never felt like there was any bitterness. But every time you come up against another striker, maybe, you're not always like the best of friends, so to speak. So today I got with me Jerome Sinclair, Watford FC striker. How you doing, bro? I'm good, man. I'm good. Can't complain. Surviving, man. So obviously you're doing you're doing quarantine right now, but where whereabouts are you in the world? I'm in Birmingham, which is obviously in my hometown. So because of the whole lockdown quarantine situation, I'm obviously playing been playing in the Netherlands this season. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've um, been able to come home and I'm just um, around some of my family. I've obviously got a place. I'm back here. So, yeah, back home at the moment. That's good. That's good, man. So, um, obviously, now is a time where you can, you know, relax, um, recharge your batteries. What kind of things have you been doing during quarantine? Obviously, you've got to stay within the guidelines, but what have you yeah. been doing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been very different. I mean, usually when you're in the off season and, I, and I'm, I'm back home, I can usually go to little things like Power League and play with some of the other players that I know from around the city. But obviously you're not allowed to gather in larger groups than three or four at the moment. So we haven't been able to do that. Power League, all those kind of places are closed at the moment. Um, gyms closed at the moment. So it's just been a lot of home stuff, to be honest. Um, got some equipment and gym stuff in my garage and stuff. So it's just been home workouts, still runs and things like that. Man, just trying to to stay taken over yeah obviously for me i'm i'm a netflix guy and uh it's crazy you know for for me like you see your friends or whoever people you may know and you can see them on tv and for us it's kind of normal not normal but like you know on tv it's like we play mm. football in it that's our job yeah. but yeah. sunderland to i die and you're mm. in it on netflix like <laughs> I don't know. For me, that's 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 just different audience now. You know what I mean? Yeah. To be honest, I mean, I had a few messages from um from fans and stuff like little DMs, um people that have just seen it and took a like into the documentary. Didn't really know me or even know Sunderland, um, but obviously just seeing it on Netflix, giving it a watch, and then they're reaching to a whole different audience audience in terms of their fan base, and obviously some people that are in the documentary players, etc obviously becoming known by more people as well. So yeah, it's, it's good in terms of raising your profile kind of thing. I didn't do too much with the film crew and stuff there, but the little bits, um, yeah, obviously people recognize and I got a few messages, yeah. Yeah, for, for you now, you could just say, I've been on Netflix, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been on Netflix. <laughs> I haven't even watched all of it, to be honest. I, I caught like one episode because, um, obviously, the season didn't end too well, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm gonna have to try and watch the rest of it definitely. So, other than Sunderland to die, what are you watching on Netflix right now? I'm watching on Netflix. Um, recently, oh, it's been Money Heist. Money Heist came out. I'm a big fan of that, so I think I watched the whole season in about two days or something like that, which isn't even good. But obviously, with what's going on right now, a bit of downtime, Netflix and that kind of thing, can't really complain. No, I love Money Heist as well. My, own, my only 
downside about it is it's so unrealistic. <laughs> you think? Like, yeah, it is. It is. It is. But it's it's good though. Like the thrill. Like there's, there's always something going on. You, I don't think you can. You can't guess what's gonna happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know when you watch those and they're predictable. I don't think it's predictable. So it's alright, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, other than Netflix, you how do you stay ticking over? And uh, what kind of things do you do? Uh, me, I tend to I tend to read a lot, and um, obviously with football, you'll know. Usually, um, in in England and even around Europe, you're, you're training in the morning, and your days are usually done by one, two o'clock, and you're at home and you have the rest of the evening to yourself, kind of thing. So I turn, I tend to just read a bit of Netflix and um, try and and do other things and take my mind off football. Do you know what I mean? Um, like investments and um, little business opportunities, anything that you can take advantage of, that kind of thing. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. So let's talk about from the time I met you, um, probably around like 14, probably at 14, 15, um, yeah, yeah. playing for England. At the time, you were at West Brom. So that whole, yeah. that whole build up in terms of going, getting to that moment, and I'm guessing at that moment, um, for all of us, that's, that's, a, that's a milestone where you're kind of starting off your journey um, and you're kind of reaping uh, the, the rewards of, you know, your hard work. Um, yeah. What, what yeah. got you to that and uh, what kind of influences uh, helped you get to that stage? Um, for me, I think one of the biggest, the, the biggest influence on my career was definitely my dad. My mm. dad was um, extremely supportive of me uh, from a young age. I think I signed for West Brom as a kid. I was eight years old, I think, um, nearly nine years old. And from from then, um, my dad obviously started to take a lot more interest in my football because I used to just play Sunday League and it was more just a fun kind of thing. But I think when my dad came and really started watching me, he obviously would take me to all my games and all my training sessions. And um, he saw the potential and he just um, made sure that he pushed me and supported me in, in any way that he could really. So I'd say my, my dad was definitely um, the biggest influencer on my, on my career as, as a young kid. Yeah, no, I, I, had, I had obviously knowing you know a lot. I've heard a lot about your dad. What kind of things that do you think he was doing? Maybe it might be different to other parents, but what he was doing so special to you? I mean, coming from the kind of background that I come from, um, like in a city background and obviously within a, a black family, whatever, sometimes parents don't have the time to, to be able to support their children like that. My dad made it a priority to kind of make sure that I was always able to get to training on time. I was always picked up and I was looked after and I always had somebody to speak to, somebody to ask for advice and just being very present because I mean I, I had friends from similar families that had to catch buses to to train in and travel across the city and my dad would sometimes offer to give them lifts and pick other players up as well that's why a lot of um some of my friends that you know will speak highly of my dad because he tried to support them as well and in, in in times when obviously their their families or their parents couldn't so just definitely being being present is a is a, is a massive factor but it, it was more than that as well like in the off seasons making sure that um, I was always on top of my fitness I went that extra mile so I, I was physically in, in a, as good a condition as I could be at that age and then also watching my game and even though he wasn't a football fan as as a as a child or, or growing up um, telling me where I could improve what he wanted to see me do what I should be striving for um, giving me that like that that criticism, it was harsh at times. It was harsh, and I I didn't like it at times. Obviously, you wouldn't. But looking back on it, it was definitely it was definitely what I needed, and um, it pushed me that extra mile and, and took my game to 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 a different level. I mean, even to the extent of speaking to my coaches all the time on on what I can do. Um, when I was doing really well, getting me access to one to one training with coaching with coaches, so I was doing more than other players. Do you know what I mean? So it it really helped, and it taught me to. I'll be honest, it took me to a different level to my peers at the time. You know what I mean? It made, it made me stand out, but I was working more than everyone, so it made sense. That's, that's good, man. That's good to hear. Like, obviously, with the young kids watching, that's kind of the things that you need to do. Sacrifices, 
um, winning mentality where you said, you know, you got harsh criticism, but you took it on the chin and mm. you took it in your stride, you know. Um, would you say that you've always been at youth level from, from the early ages, from eight to, let's say, 14, were you always, like, that good? Um, I think at, at, when I was young, eight, nine, um, when I just went into academy football, I had a year or so in Sunday League. Um, I went into academy football. I was good. Um, I was quite big for my age, so I was physically able to dominate a lot of the players I was playing against. And I think when I was about 10, 10 11, I started playing up um, age groups regularly. Um, and I think for a, a year and a half or so, um, I was I was just okay. I was good. I would score goals and stuff, but I don't think I was outst- out, too outstanding. But I think um, at that point, um, West Brom started putting a lot more work into me, obviously, with the influence of my dad. And um, from about the age of about 11, 12, um, it, was a, it was a big change. Um, I started playing up more age groups, but I started standing out more, even though I was playing up more age groups. So um, I think at that age, I kind of I t- I took a, a big step. That's good to hear, man. So, you know, obviously in your area, you got so many so many talented players like for me it's, it's hard to differentiate Birmingham for me coming from London so the way I just see it is Birmingham but for you I, I know for, for example there's probably an area in Birmingham which is a catchment area for a lot of players what, yeah. what area did you come from and do you think that had an impact in like the player you are today yeah definitely I mean I um, obviously started um, a Sunday league team called Phoenix United, which was like in one of the inner city areas in um, in Birmingham. But at the time, they had uh, an agreement with West Brom. So any players that were outstanding, um, they had to go to West Brom on trial before they could go anywhere else. And obviously, I think West Brom helped with the funding of the club, day-to-day running and things like that, and, um, and really helped out, obviously, financially. Um, but yeah, that club, obviously... Um, yeah, it's provided a lot of players. Really? Uh, the likes of um, Saido Berahino, obviously myself, um, Tavon Campbell, and numerous um, younger players that are, are coming through at the moment and are, are making um, making names for themselves in the game um, have, have come through that club and the West Brom system. And, and now that club um, actually has a similar agreement with Aston Villa. So I think um, a lot of players um, are coming through there now and going into the Aston Villa Academy and trying to make their way in the game. So, yeah. Yeah, for, for you at that age, was it just, I don't care who I end up playing for or was it like you had your eyes set on one team? In Birmingham, there's, there's a few big teams in that area. So, I mean, for me, um, when I, I, was, I was that young when I went to West Brom, it didn't really matter. I, I was just... I wasn't too familiar um, with the whole academy setup, how it worked. Um, I had only been playing Sunday League football for for a year. The funny thing was, um, at that time, when I started, I was seven, nearly eight, but mm. didn't ha- actually have any um, teams for my age group um, in the Sunday League team. Really? So the, young team, the youngest team was like on the 10s. I was like seven. So these guys were all like three years older than me. But because um, the guy who ran the club um, was a friend a um, family friend uh, he just said uh, yeah just bring him along and he can play so I just played with the under 10s and I was with that team for um, the whole year and then the next year they made the team for my age group and then I then dropped down to play for my age group and it was in the pre-season friendlies there was West Brom scouts um, there and they said yeah we want to we have a look at him um, with our boys so I went obviously on trial um, at West Brom and within a few sessions I ended up signing for West Brom but like I said I wasn't too familiar with the the whole academy so I just was enjoying playing football at the moment at that point I was falling in love with the game I was it was posters all over my bedroom match magazines I don't know if you remember match magazines yeah and of course yeah FIFA everything do you know what I mean so yeah it was just about enjoying playing football and yeah go and play for West Brom why not I know I know you're you're a big Henri fan yeah, definitely. Henri was um, my idol. I was definitely an Arsenal fan as a kid. 
Yeah. But I was, an, I was an Henri fan as a kid, so I was an Arsenal fan. And when he left, it kind of filtered out a little bit. But yeah, uh, definitely. Time, time's got hard, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it got depressing being an Arsenal fan, man. You don't have me emotional, man. <laughs> uh, so let, let's fast forward to, um, to when you made your debut for England. Yeah. So all of that, basically what you just mentioned, um, leading up to that moment so that's kind of like for academy player that's like the pinnacle you know um yeah. or the start uh, the start of it anyway um yeah. and then after that would come like your debut so yeah. playing playing for england i'm guessing your whole family must have been watching on tv and things like that how, how did that yeah. feel man yeah it was um it was a huge moment i think now being a little bit older and mm. um, one of the things you realize is um when you when you're going through, when you're coming up as a young player, you have these moments, but you realise you take everything so seriously. Mm. Every game is like the be all, end all. I mean, you could be like, you're 10, but <laughs> if you yeah, don't yeah. score the game, you go home and I'm angry until I go back to school on a Monday and then and if I don't have a good session on the Monday, I'm, I'm still angry from the game. Do you know what I mean? Like, it mm. all means so much to you. And then I always remember... Um, one of the boys that I was really close with at West Brom, um, Callum Jones, who yeah. was an exceptional player at um, those ages as well. We we used to watch, obviously, the Victory Shield every yeah. year. And we would have these conversations where it's like, when we get to 14, 15, 16, we have to be there. Yeah. That has to be us. And um, we both did. We both um, ended up playing um, for England. I played in the Victory Shield. He, he played, I think, later um, in that year. So we we both um, kind of reached our goal, but yeah, it's, it's a it's a very serious for young players. It's a very um, like you said, it's it's the pinnacle, definitely. So, from from then, I can't remember. You have to jog my memory. Were you still at West Brom then, or was it a transition? No, um, when I actually um got to that age where it's like in the under 16s and stuff, I was at Liverpool at that time. Yeah. yeah. So that I, I remember at that time that was that was big news, man, for every player like around our age. And I think if you correct me if I'm wrong, that was like one of the last um one of the last transfers for that age to go through tribunal. Was that true? Um yeah, it did. It did go through um tribunal, I think. It did. Um there was a, a whole situation about it, but Obviously, that all that only happens after the move has already taken place. So, obviously, when you're that age, I was only 14. I wasn't paying too much attention to that. Like all I knew is I was at Liverpool now. I'm playing and training there. I'm scoring goals there, and that's all for the people higher up in the club at West Brom and obviously at Liverpool to sort out. As, obviously, as a kid, you don't care about all that. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you moved to Liverpool, dream come true. But like, what? What was your your feelings still at West Brom? Because it obviously it's close to home. Um, you you got a lot of friends there, and you have a lot of people who kind of you know helped you get to like your stage. So, like, was it not? I wouldn't say a bit sweet. It's sweet that you signed for Liverpool. But was it like a situation where it was like you're young and all of this noise is happening behind you? You just want to play football. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of that. I mean, obviously for me. West Brom was obviously extremely close to my heart. I signed there when I was eight, left when I was 14. Um, it is my hometown club. I, I used to walk to training sometimes from my mum's house. It was that close. Um, and the way we trained was obviously across the road from the, the stadium. Um, and then I, I ended up going to a school that was across the road from the stadium as well. So everything in my life was West Brom. Um, it came to the point where I ended up leaving, going to Liverpool, which was obviously a dream come true. But yeah, West Brom was very close to my heart. Still is, um, obviously, something I hold close to my heart, definitely. Going to Liverpool. Uh, I heard so many stories about, like, how it is to play for the club. Like, it's something that you... It's just different, that you can't imagine it. Like, the the worldwide velocity velocity behind it and also the people from the city, how passionate they are. Like, just talk about, like, that whole transition and you basically become, like, a, 
probably a sensation at the time overnight. Like, I don't have a bad word to say about that club. Definitely, I mean it's it's huge, and I felt it straight away. I think um, I remember I was in school one day, and some articles like came out that um, I was going to Liverpool, basically Liverpool getting this kid from Birmingham, blah blah blah. Um, within like a few hours, thousands of followers on Twitter. This is when Twitter's just come out. I've got my little BlackBerry. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm just seeing notifications and fans saying welcome welcome i'm thinking wow this is it's crazy um so i definitely felt it in terms of the the welcoming and and the fan base that the club has is huge and then um the history that comes obviously along with of representing a club like that you, like i said you take everything so seriously at that age and i remember um i went to a tournament with um i think it was the 96 birthdays um because they do when you know when they do the foreign tournaments at that age because yeah. it, it's from the ages in england um with liverpool and that was obviously the first time I, I played um and i just remember putting on a shirt and just being like wow it's liverpool and i remember at the time um liverpool was with the sponsor by adidas and they had those tight fitting shirts and yeah. i remember like playing against liverpool when i was a kid and they used to come out in these fit shirts with like, yeah. yo, Liverpool's mad, you know. And you used to go to the academy and be like, wow. And I was yeah. there, so obviously it was, it was special. It was definitely special. Yeah, man. Um, no, I, I had mad stories about Liverpool and when you were young, especially. I always wanted to ask you, how was it going to the school there? Because that, that's like something that like everyone knows, that if you sign for Liverpool and you're a young player, you go to the school. So how was that? It was different for me. Um, yeah, school was it was different because I I ended up going to three secondary schools. I I went to um, a school in Birmingham, and then I then moved to the school that was close to the West Brom ground um, because West Brom had like a a connection with that school basically, and they wanted a lot of players to go there. So I, I ended up going to that school, and then obviously when I moved to Liverpool, it was something similar, but in Liverpool, so I ended up going to three different secondary schools, but um. Yeah, it was it was good. They the way they look after the players, the way they cater to their their young players, and um, give everything towards developing the player, obviously as a person, educationally, and then obviously with with football, it's you can't fault it. The the system they have there is unbelievable. There's a building at the school just mm. for the young Liverpool yeah. players. When I was going, um, it was it was in the starting stages, but I think by the time I left. Liverpool, there was uh, 30, 40 kids crazy. in the school that were Liverpool players, yeah, something crazy like that. Bust them in every day and then they'd be leaving from there, um, going straight to, to training. I remember we, it was a big it was a big change for me because I, I used to train a lot, obviously, at West Brom, but then when I then went to Liverpool, I was in year 10 at the time. And um, I used to... My dad would drop me to school in the morning. It would be every single day, five days a week. Uh, you'd leave straight from school with the players, bus straight to the academy. You'd eat, you'd train, um, and then obviously go home on a, I think it was on, on a Wednesday and a Friday. You'd leave school at lunchtime and go and train in the afternoon, then train again in the evening. Wow. So it was it was it was a it was a crazy schedule which took its toll. I ended up having a, quite a few injuries at those days just through um, adjusting to training so much. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, it was it was really good and the whole system that you can't fault it definitely. Yeah, man. Um, obviously, for you, um, you're from Birmingham. So how how was the transition from the two cities? Like living in Liverpool to Birmingham, what are the similarities and differences? How did you find it? Um, it's, it's very different, very different. Um, once you, you move to Liverpool, you quickly realise that the, the whole city is just orientated around football. It's yeah. crazy. I, I had no idea that like you've got Stanley Park and then on one side of the park, you've got Anfield and then the other side of the park, you've got Goodison Park. Crazy. Yeah. It's, like, there's nothing like that in Birmingham. I don't think there's anything like that in London either. Do you know what I mean? It's that close. Every time you get into a taxi, it's, uh, are you red or blue? Like, you know what I mean? It's just, the city's just orientated around football. Like, you got in the city centre, one of the first things um, I saw 
it was a, a new shopping center called Liverpool One. So Liverpool opened their club shop there and named it Liverpool One. So what Everton opened their club shop right next door, call it Everton Two. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it just sums up the city. Do you know what I mean? It just sums it up. But yeah, man, it's a, it's a special place, definitely. So from from then on, you've experienced all that. Um, was did your dad your dad moved up there with you? Yeah, yeah. When my dad moved with me, he moved me and my dad up there. Um, which was which was cool, which is different. I was used to, obviously used to living with my mother back home. Obviously, my dad was the one that supported me mostly with my football. So I have two younger brothers. My mom, they stayed down in Birmingham, and I moved to Liverpool with my dad. Obviously, fourteen at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, but even so, I, I can imagine <laughs> your your dad still put roles and chores on you and things that you had to do, right? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, my dad's old school Jamaican, you know what I yeah. mean? So, yeah, I gotta, I'm doing all this training, but i got to do my cleaning. I've got to stay on top of things, and I'm definitely, definitely going to keep me grounded along with everything else that's going on. So, uh, yeah, taking all of that in and... Um, being there for a couple of years now, um, you end up making your debut and you end up becoming the youngest player to play for Liverpool. That is crazy. Like, that's historic. Like, yeah. At the time, did you take that in or did you take it in afterwards? Like, we just mentioned where you're going at 100 miles per hour, you don't realize, like, yeah, what you're yeah. I mean, everything, everything happens so quickly. Um, obviously, I, I was in year 11 at the time, so I'd been in Liverpool about eight, just over a year. Um, I started with the under-16s, um, and then the next season, the plan was to be with the, the youth team, the under-18s, um, and obviously I was going to be turning 16 that season. But in the, I think at this point, Brendan Rodgers came in um, over the summer, and in that pre-season, I was with the, the youth team and I scored a bunch of goals. So um, in all the pre-season friendly, it was like hat-tricks and two. I remember. Two. I remember. Yeah. yeah. And um, <laughs> I'll never forget it. Um, I'm not sure if it was an international break, but whenever it was an inter- international break anyway, um, Rogers would always call some of the young players to come and train with the first team. And I promise you, that first training session I had with the first team was the best training session I've ever had in my life. Wow. Like, everything I touched was a goal. Like, <laughs> I remember the games at the end, I must have scored about six, seven goals. Like, just, yeah, I don't know where it came from, but I was just so happy to be there and everything went for me. And I think Rogers called me over at the end of the session and was like, yeah, I really like you and you're going to be up here more, et cetera, et cetera. So I started training there a bit more. Um, and I was still scoring goals in all the games I was playing with the youth teams and uh, I played a couple games with the, the, the 21s and stuff, was doing well. So came to the first um, League Cup game and I was in the squad. Funny enough, it was against West Brom. So travelled down with, with the team, um, stayed in the hotel, etc. Um, went to the game and... At the hotel, obviously found out I was on the bench. I thought I would just be traveling. Ended up finding out, wow, well, I'm on the bench. So that's cool. Warmed up, et cetera, with the team. My family's there. Like obviously my mom, dad, my brothers, everybody, all my friends. And a lot of the boys, it was crazy. A lot of the boys that I played against, I mean, played with at West Brom. Some of them were, were ball boys at the game. So I was seeing like, all my friends and everything. Um, yeah, I'm just warming up as normal, just doing as you do on the bench, just taking everything in. And then obviously Gaffer says, go for a run. It's like 70 something minutes. You're coming on. I'm like, that is so <laughs> <laughs> Happened. Never forget it. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff, man. So I, I got two questions. I remember during that time where you said you were scoring goals for, uh, was it the youth team or reserves? Uh, the youth team first, yeah. But um, I think because it was pre-season friendlies, um, it was like a mix of the, the yeah. youth team and the team, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I remember, um, I don't know why I remember this, but for some reason, it's like at that moment in time, did you feel like maybe you, you should have been 
you were doing well and you should have been playing a high a higher level like reserves or something for some reason i remember that i remember like like um, one of the games you were you were angry or something or something happened i can't remember what happened uh nah, i don't think at that time i think maybe a year later or yeah a year and a half later or something like that because i had what happened with me is i had this crazy period where i just come out of under 16 but basically for me i started at liverpool um playing under 16s but when i was at west brom i'd been playing under 16 since i was at 12 so like yeah, it's I, normal. I, was like, I can play higher than this, but it wasn't anything anyway. I played the season there. At the end of that first season, I played some games with the youth team anyway. But yeah, so because it was a mixture of like the um, the under 18s and the second team at that stage in preseason, I wasn't too fussed. But what I was going to say is, after this period where I made my debut, scoring all these goals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I started struggling with injuries, and then it was like a year later, maybe a year and a half later, and because of all the injuries I've had. I hadn't really had any progression and it was like I had to then rebuild because I was getting injured so much, I had to rebuild my body and then rebuild in terms of football and progression because it was like I'd stagnated a little bit, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. let, let's go back to let's go back to the debut. Um the second point I wanted to make was you're you're playing in front of your your friends, your family, um, you know, their bull boys, um you're the youngest player on the pitch by far. Yeah. Um, what what would you say in in terms of that, like how you felt in that moment? Because when you're young, you don't take it in as when you're yeah. older. I feel like when you're older, maybe, like obviously when you're young, you put a lot of pressure on yourself and yeah. it's normal. But because you're doing so well anyway, it's like, you know, even if you didn't come on that day, it would be like, yeah, I didn't come on, but I'm with the first team. You know what I mean? Yeah, still but, a huge experience. Yeah, still a huge experience. But, like, you know, when you get older, your mindset maybe starts to change. So what would you say your mindset is when you're young, which enabled you, say, for example, to go with the first team, first training session, bang in all those goals, um, do it again uh, week after week with the first team, and then basically get selected to be on the bench? And basically, come on and have a have a good game for a sixteen year old. What? How would you say the mentality is different from a sixteen year old in his in his stride like that compared to like when you're older? I think um, at that age, I just had no fear. Like at that age, whenever I was on the pitch, whenever I was training, I used to. It was like I was just playing with my boys in the park. Do you know what I mean? Like I would try anything. I'll shoot from anywhere. I'll try any skill, and eight times out of ten, it's gonna work. Mm. It was work. I mean, so it was just like you had no fear. Like it's not to say you didn't respect who you were playing against, but you didn't think about it. Like it doesn't matter if this guy played in the World Cup for England or whatever. Like I'm gonna try and make it most. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you, yeah. Have no, you have you have no fear at, at that age. And then I think when you get a bit older, you start to think about things more. I then um, came in contact with coaches that um, wanted to coach me a lot more um, and how I could incorporate the way I play into the professional game. Whereas I just wanted to enjoy the ball every time I had it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I definitely think I'm, it's just a matter of having no fear and just trying anything and everything. Yeah, I would say anyone watching this, um, when you're young, I would say, and you're really, you know, doing well and stuff, kind of never lose that kind of mentality because with that mentality it's scary it's, it's really scary when you have that you're playing fearless you're you're playing free you know and then mm. when you're when you're in that mode you're always going to play better nine times out of ten than in a in a different mindset where you're thinking too much and everything like that of course you have to have preparation and um you have to have hard work to get you to where you are, which will prepare you for the moment. So, like, you know, all those hard years working, um, going to training five times a week, uh, doing double sessions, all, all of that plays a part into, you know, coming um, onto the pitch at 16 and doing well. But in terms of your mentality, I would say the mentality you just described, that is like the something that you should never lose basically definitely definitely i think as as you get older 
coaches have more of an influence on on your game. They want you to play a certain way. They want you to fit into how they see their team or you start having to play for results and it's less about you as an individual and you have to play your part in the team. But within that, you have to kind of understand that you're putting that team for a reason because of the things that you can do. Do you know what I mean? So you, you can't you can't lose that. You still have to to play free to some extent and enjoy yourself, express yourself in certain ways and not always 100% conform to what a certain coach is saying because realistically, I want to say it, coaching talent out of players is real. Do you know what I mean? 100%, it, yeah, yeah. As, as, as young players, you definitely have to to keep that, that thing that makes you different, certain types of players anyway, in certain positions. I think defenders and goalkeepers, etc., can get away with different things. Whereas mm-hmm. when you're a striker or an attacker and you have something that um, differentiates you from other players and you have something that's a bit different, you definitely have to keep that. 100%, 100% agree. So you just mentioned after that kind of period, you struggled with a few injuries and stuff. But the thing that sticks out in my head is two things. Number one, you had a great bounce back from all of that because you ended up like getting another opportunity to play uh, for Liverpool. And mm. number two, I would say advice to young people. This is the flip side of the coin. You don't realise when you're in the moment, right? So you played that FA Cup game and you scored and you were 18, right? Or well, 19? Yeah, yeah 18, 18. 18. And I guarantee you, your mindset at that stage, of course, you, you have a winning mentality and you want to you wanna, uh, exceed levels and you want to uh, be playing week in, week out for your club, right? But still, during that time, to even play at 18, that is still big, to play for Liverpool at 18. But at the yeah. time, you probably wouldn't realise that. You probably would have said at the time, I should have got a chance by now, again, you know, or... Well, for me, it wasn't like I should have got a chance um, by now in terms of somebody else should have handed me the opportunity. It just, it was just like, I want more from myself. Like, for me, it was like I was 16, made my debut, and from them, then it should have been steps that I took. Do you know what I mean? And through, because of injuries, etc., I wasn't able to take them steps. So then I went through a lot in terms of it was like basically like a year um, of just solid injuries and then a year and a half, really. And then this, I remember at the, the end of that season, the summer, um, I, had to, I had to start doing yoga, hot yoga. It's like all the players were going on holiday and stuff. But that summer, I just stayed in Liverpool. I was like, I just need to get myself right. So I had to start um, doing hot yoga like three times a week just to increase my flexibility because I was getting a lot of muscle injuries. I then had to see... Uh, strength and conditioning coach uh, to put on a bit of mass um, and get stronger. Then I had to also see like a, a guy to correct my running technique um, so that the way I was moving functionally, making sure that wasn't causing me any yeah, injuries because I was having a lot of muscle injuries. Yeah, I was having a lot of muscle injuries and I was also having a lot of growth related joint knee injuries and stuff like that. So yeah, I just had to do a lot to get myself right. I then went into the that season with Liverpool's youth team, bearing in mind I'm 18 now. At the start of this, I'm a September birthday, so mm. I'm 18 at the start of the season, my 18th birthday, and I was playing in an under 18s youth game um, on my 18th birthday. And in my mind, I'm I know why I'm there, but I'm so motivated and I'm so angry because two years ago I was making my debut. Now two years later, I'm playing under 18s. Do you know what I mean? So. I just put in all that work and then started the season there, basically progressed. And then by the end of that season, I was back making appearances for the first team. So, um, so obviously, yeah, it, it, it all worked out. I think I played against you. Um, I don't, yeah, in a, in a, I remember in a tournament, actually, it was at a Tottenham training ground. So for, for you to go from, um, from that to at the end of that season, um, you know, playing for the first team again and scoring, like, how did, how did that make you feel and what was your mentality after that? Um, at that point, 
I was just excited. I was very, um, I was humbled by the whole experience. I felt like I'd put in a lot of work and it was starting to pay off. Um, things were, were getting back on track for me and I was where I wanted to be. So um, yeah, I was definitely um, happy, but I was very aware of the work that I'd put in and I was kind of happy with myself that I'd, I felt like I'd, I'd pushed through a big barrier. Do you know what I mean? And I was, now I, I can see that I was only at the start of all the obstacles and the trials and tribulations, the ups and the downs that you're going to experience in football. But um, yeah, I was very happy at that point, definitely. During that time period, you've experienced like a lot of players in the first team. What kind of, what kind of players were still there at Liverpool at, around that time? Um, that season when I started, uh, when I was 18, um, by this time I, I was full-time with the first team at the end of that season. Um, yeah, the likes of um, Storage was there, but he was um, experiencing a lot of injuries. Suarez was still there, Coutinho, Gerard. Uh, Jose Enrique, um, yeah, people like that. There was there was some huge names in the changing room, still so definitely. So being being around that, like, it's just you know, for you being a young player, like that that keeps you number one on track of what the goal actually is, and number two, like you're you're playing with world class players. So number one, what did you see in training? And, and, and number two, what kind of things would they say to you? Advice and things like that. Um, it was, it was eye-opening um, training with, with those guys, definitely seeing the level that some of them were at. Obviously, Gerard was in like the last year um, of his career. But the training with those guys, Gerard was the best. Like... Along, even though like yeah, the likes of Suarez, Coutinho, so the things that Gerard can do with football, any pass off any surface, any foot, he can do it. Do you know what I mean? And it, there'll be moments where he do things in training, and you people would just stop and clap, and you just be thinking, yeah, that's why he's Steven Gerard. You like to, to train with somebody like that day in day out. You can see everything. Sometimes you you don't see it on a, on a match day. Do you know what I mean? Just watching in the Premier League, you, obviously you can see he's a world-class player, but training with them guys day in day out, you see certain things and you're like, damn, <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, it was very eye-opening because at the same time, you see people like that. You see people like Coutinho who just have an unbelievable God-given talent that they can do crazy things with the football as well small guy you just can't get near him and then you also had people like Mario Balotelli as well which is was an indication of someone who had all the talent but there was something missing like the, the mentality and it, it, it wasn't 100% right do you know what I mean um so yeah it was, it was definitely eye-opening so you know two things what I remember one time you told me it was like one of Steven Jard's last training sessions or something and you're saying he still could have played on if he wanted to. Um, he, he said something about, I just remember, he zinged the ball, like, the other side of the pitch with his left foot, and it, like, it didn't, it didn't go like this, it didn't go like that, it didn't bounce, it just went like this across the pitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't remember that one specifically, but I, I always remember there was one time um, we were playing a game in training and it was like um, a small possession. But, you know, when you have four goals, four small goals. Yeah. But the goals are facing the wrong way, if you know what I mean. So the goals are all facing the outside of the pitch. You get me? Yeah. One like near each corner are facing the outside of the pitch. And from one side, he's pinged it basically across the pitch, diagonally, but into the goal. Like it's dropped and then span back into the goal. And it was just like... Who would even try that? Like, you can't even do that. Like, do you know what I mean? And it was what? one of them where you just stop and clap, like, literally from diagonally over the goal. And it's like it's dropped and then spam back into the goal. And it was like... No, that's... What? So, so I, I know what you're talking about, but the people, they might not, like, be in trainings mm -hmm. and whatever. So just imagine you have a pitch, yeah? Yeah, so you've got, like, it's about, uh, probably about... Yeah. 20 by 20, something like that. 20, 20 by 20 pitch. And yeah. let's say normally, like in a normal game, you'd have, you'd have a goal here and a goal here. But yeah. let's just say there's, 
those mini is mini goals, right? Yeah, mini goals, mini goals. But you've got there's, four. There's, there's, just say those mini goals are faced the other way. They're not faced yeah, out. The goals are, they're faced off yeah, the they're pitch. They're not facing into the pitch. The four goals are facing out, basically. And, yeah. and the other two are facing out as well. And he's yeah. hit a ball yeah. over the goal and it's span back in the net. Yeah. Basically, yeah. what you see people do from, like, I don't know, you see these videos on Instagram where they're yeah. like, near the corner flag and they try to spin it in. And yeah. he's yeah. basically but done that. Like, but Yeah, this, this is in the middle of the possession. People are ratting around because it's a small game. Pressing, obviously, I just wanted everyone pressing. It's tight. And it was on about two, three touch max. And you just, yeah. <laughs> that was definitely one of the moments. Like, uh, yeah. That's Steve, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've, I've, I don't think I've been around greatness like that before. Mm-hmm. That's, that sounds like madness. So what, what, was he, what was he like as a captain? Very good. He was, um, he was very good with me as well. Spoke to me quite a bit. I had a good relationship. Um, and he um, definitely made me feel involved. And, um, yeah, he was, he was good for me. He, um, he asked me to play in his... It was the equivalent of a testimonial. Yeah. It was like a charity game. Um, and it was basically his all-star team against Carragher's all-star team. Um, yeah, so he asked me and a few other players to play as well. And I ended up starting that game. Funny enough, on a front three, I was on the left. Thierry Henry in the middle and Ryan Babel on the right. Madness. Yeah, that was, I could never thank him enough for that. That was, gave me the opportunity to obviously meet my idol, speak to him, obviously rack his brains and get into answer questions and things like that. So, yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah, man. Um, so, obviously, after that stage, um, you, you have another season at Liverpool after that. Mm. Where, where, where would you say the, the reason why you, you felt like maybe it was time to, to move on? Um, those, are, those are a lot of factors. Um, looking at the players that they had there, um, it, was, it was always going to be difficult for, it's always going to be difficult for a young striker to go in there and play regularly. Do you know what I mean? And you're going to need time to adjust and to, to break yourself into a team like that. So it's going to be difficult. People that came after me have, have obviously found the same thing. It was obviously a contract situation. I was coming to the end of my contract. And um, it just, it, it felt right at that time um, with the options that I had on the table um, to, go, to go elsewhere. Obviously, I did it with a heavy heart. I didn't want to leave the club. But um, I think at that at that moment in time, it was um, right to make the decision that I did. You signed for Watford. Yeah. Um, moving to London, how how was that transition again? Because now you went north, then you go back mm. down south, past yeah. your hometown, all the way to London. How was that? Very different. Very different. Obviously, a lot of the distractions that come outside of football. They're like at the, in your face and at the forefront when you come to London. All the things you might not want to be around. Do you know what I mean? It's in your face when you're in London. Um, it's very different in terms of football as well. In terms of the club that I went into, very different organisation to Liverpool in terms of the way it was ran by the owners and um, the philosophies and, and things like that and the way they were. So yeah, it was, um, it was a big adjustment. Do you realise um, when you actually come to London maybe you hear a couple of things before you come that you actually realize like how like how intense and how it, it, it's it's a lot of as you said distractions for for young footballers you know yeah I think for young footballers um in London it's two things one the concentration of clubs is so high there's so many clubs in London so there's a lot of competition for young players in London because obviously the population is so high. There's loads of players in your age, in your position, like just to get to clubs and um, and your development as a player. It, it's difficult, do you know what I mean? Just because of how much talent there is there. So that's one thing. Then when you get a little bit older, in terms of the distractions, you realise why when, you, when people talk about cities in the world, like your New York, or Los Angeles, Milan, Paris, London is one of those cities. Mm-hmm. You realise because of 
the nightlife and the wealth and just everything that is to do with London, you realize that it's so much more than everywhere else in the country. So I know it's definitely a thing where young players can go to London and get completely lost in the lifestyle and completely lose focus of football, what they're there to do and become consumed with obviously living a crazy lifestyle in London. So yeah, it's, it's definitely things you got to contend with. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, what you basically just said, there's, there's also um, one thing you just basically said, adding on to that, every foreign player who comes to the Premier League, their preference is to live in London. So yeah. you also have that added on. So yeah. for example, um, you get two teams who are very similar. You get a Burnley and let's, let's say, for example, you take a Watford. Mm. You're going to find more better foreign talent at the team in London than you will mm. in Burnley. So mm. that has a massive effect on, and it fills down to the youth. Would you, yeah, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. For the claiming, because of the reason I just said, um, London is one of those cities in the world where people want to go and experience. So if a player, a lot of players will look at it, they're going to come to England and they have the chance to go to London and experience living in London. A lot of them are going to take that um, over going to live up north. Do you know what I mean? So, so yeah, he's definitely have to contend with that as well. It makes the competition even more. Yeah, and then secondly, what you just said is is hundred percent true. <laughs> Growing up in London is hard. Mm. To, to not to not get you know distracted by whether it be your friends or your like in some other cases they're not your friends. Mm. They're 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 people who are just there for the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number three, um, also boredom you know so let's say for example like you said earlier you finish training um in some cases i've finished i finished training at 12 30 yeah, so yeah. you're showered you're gone out the building by one which is rare in a normal job and mm. it shouldn't i feel like it, it shouldn't really be like that in no. um professional football because you're trying to achieve your goals so you should always especially if you're young as well you should always be trying to um add on to your game and improve your game um yeah. so then you you go after uh training and now you're bored now you have nothing to do you're in this big city um and you need to find time and like you could be by yourself how how yeah. was how was that like trying to I was, focus with, yeah i mean for me i was lucky that i had a girlfriend at the time that was living with me so it wasn't too bad in terms of distractions, yeah, there was definitely there. And because she was there, she wanted to do certain things as well. But if I was single, I felt it would have been a lot more difficult because you come home and there's always a restaurant you can go to. Yes. There's always a girl that you can meet up with. Your friends will always, there's always a bar or a club that you can go to in London every single day of the week. Do you know what I mean? If you want to come out of your house in London on any day of the week, you can do it and you'll find yourself, yeah, I went to get some food, but then uh, you went to, a little shisha place or a little lounge after and before you know it you look at your phone and it's 2 a.m and you got training tomorrow you know yeah. what i mean so little things like that in birmingham it's definitely not the same as in there's little places like that but you're gonna find that if you're doing that you're gonna be going to the same place every yeah. week it's gonna be yeah. boring then even more up north i don't think you have um it's not even like that you know what i mean there's not that many places where you can can go like that you know what i mean so Definitely, with distractions, London is a completely different ball game. Yeah, and I also find if you're, let's say, for example, up north um, or maybe in Birmingham and you're doing that every day, then it would be like the level of boredom will you'll look at yourself and you'll be like, why am I here, this particular mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. every single day? But in London, yeah. it's not really like that. You don't really take that in because there's mm -hmm. so much selection and mm -hmm. so many different things to do. and so many distractions then you you kind of get lost in mm. your own bubble and you end up maybe looking back and being like oh you know yeah that i, I wasn't mm. at that time i wasn't as focused as i, I should have been 
Yeah. So um, I know I know that's the case for a, a lot of uh, London players. Um, so for, for you playing for Watford, um, I know Watford's a little bit outside of London, but um, how how did you find the fan relation in comparison to to Liverpool? Obviously, it's not on the scale of Liverpool, but yeah. How 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 did you find um, the area, um, the fans, and all of that type of stuff? Um, I found, in terms of the the fans, uh, I found it was a, a bit more similar to being back home. It was a bit more similar to West Brom. Um, I think I've because I was probably a bit more submerged in it when I was um, at West Brom because I was living in the area. Everybody you see is going to be a West Brom fan if they support any club. Whereas in London, it's different. Like some people are just going about their daily lives and have zero interest in football and mm. wouldn't know if you got in the back of the cab, they wouldn't know if you were David Beckham or not. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Obviously, that doesn't really happen up north. There's, I, do, I did find that um, in London, it's, it's kind of good to, you can go under the radar and nobody really cares, no matter who you are. I'm not saying my profile was so big or whatever, but it was just you felt like, yeah, you can just blend in and nobody cares about you, which is cool. Yeah, and it's, it's normal to, let's say, for example, to have a nice car or maybe yeah. you're up north and you're in that car, you could have been spotted yeah, yeah. and all that and you couldn't go about your daily life. So mm. let's talk about football. There's also the flip side about that because you can be, that means you can be out here just doing everything and anything and nobody would really know, like, do you know what I mean? Exactly, exactly. There's always two sides to that. Um, but, yeah, let, let's talk about football now. Um, when when you arrive at Watford, did it meet your expectations? Did it exceed your expectations? Did you, um, were you underwhelmed in terms of um, how you, you, the layout was for you to go there and basically to um, proceed uh, did you know that you know let's say for example the club has a, a lot of ties to a lot of different teams and around the world and and things like that yeah um obviously whenever you go into a situation like that you go in with goals and aspirations but at the same time for me um yeah I had that but I was still young do you know what I mean I was still at Premier League club and with the first team every day, I'm in the squad for every game, and it's like I'm I'm still I'm working towards what I need to do. So by this time, I'm learning more about football, about how things work, and it was definitely in that time period um, I learned a lot about the way football works, the outside influences, and it's not all as um as rosy and as simple as you might think. So yeah, it was definitely for me. I think it was just a big um, learning period, really. Uh, you have a uh, Troy Deeney at Watford. Um, everyone talks about how influential he is um, in terms of the club, in terms of us as a person. He's also from Birmingham. How how did he help you in in that phase? Um, um, just being kind of I could I could imagine a big brother type figure to you. Yeah, definitely for me. Um, he was Troy was there for me. Just helped me settle in. Um, even to this day, like if I need anything, I can get on the phone to him, and he's he's that guy with a lot of the young players there. He's he's that kind of big brother figure. Um, you always feel like you can speak to him as and when and if you need to. So it definitely helped me a lot. It obviously helped being from Birmingham as well, um, knowing some of the same people. Um, one of my friends was able to ask me, "Hey, make sure you look after Jay when he goes down there." Blah blah blah, and he kind of. Definitely took that on and yeah, you helped me a lot, definitely. How, how would you, obviously, without saying, um, well, he's had a great career, Trey Deeney, but, you know, when you're a captain, there's different types of captains. With Gerard, I don't know how he is, but he doesn't even need to talk. He just shows you on the pitch. Yeah, yeah. Trey Deeney, yeah. he's not as talented as Gerard, but um, I can imagine just his influence uh is big. How how would you describe the two in terms of captains and um, how Troy Deeney is as a captain in general? Um, I think in terms of the way they lead, um, for different obviously different personalities, but in terms of the way they lead, kind of, um, kind of similar. Um, obviously with Gerard, he kind of didn't need to say too much. 
because he was in the middle of the park and everything kind of went through him. Do you know what I mean? It's similar with Troy. He, they both do, are vocal at times, but through their performance and what they do on the pitch, they lead through that. With Troy, there's a massive difference with Watford between when he's on the pitch and when he's not on the pitch. Yeah. He's, he's just a focal point for the team. When he's, on, when he's there, everything can go through him. Do you know what I mean? As in, if the team's under any pressure, you know if you play the ball up to Trey, there's going to be that respite. Do you know what I mean? Like he's a, the way he plays means that he can just lead through his performance and he's a vocal point for the team in a similar way to Gerard. They, they do speak and they are vocal, but they don't really have to be at times. Yeah, what would you say the most underrated thing about him is? I'd say definitely the fact that he is that vocal point for a team, the difference between Watford when he's there and he's not there is is clear to be seen. They've got good strikers in the team. You've got the likes of Andre Gray, you've got Wild back there now. You've got quality players, but there's still something that Troy brings that's different to them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, for for you, um, you know, you, you made uh, a few appearances um, off the bench and things like that. Um, in, in that in that time period, how hard is it to be like, like, I'm I'm close, I'm close, I'm getting there, but like it's just it's just not happening. Like in terms of, I'm not getting maybe the opportunity that you you're, you're trying to strive towards and work hard for. Yeah, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult mentally because when you are that close, you know, like, a flip of the coin, something could happen, could change everything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, um, yeah, it's difficult, but you just have to be patient. I know a lot of players will, will be going through similar things at this moment in time. You just got to be patient. And then when you do go get those opportunities, you just have to make the most of them. But at the same time, without putting that pressure on yourself, you have to still try and be that player that is free and can express themselves and, and be comfortable when they're on the pitch and not be putting pressure on yourself as in, you have to do something today if I get this 10 minutes. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's mm. difficult to get the balance, but yeah, that, that's, that's what you go through. Who, who would you say um, in the Premier League has been your hardest uh, opponent, your hardest opposition that you've played against, either team-wise or either um, opponent-wise? Um, hardest opponent in the Premier League. Um, I'd say when I made my Premier League debut it was against Chelsea. So I think the back two was John Terry and um Gary Cahill. Oh, and as a as a partnership, I wasn't against them for too long, but they just seemed pretty formidable. Do you know what I mean? They were um obviously big physical presences but the way they read the game was obviously just on a different level you're at Watford and you have a few loans um mm. well at the time did you did you feel like okay now I need to go and play a bit more or did you feel like maybe I'm gonna stay here and you know try to get my chance uh through mm. maybe being off the bench or things like that mm. what what's your what's your thought process in that time where it's hard to choose between a loan or staying at your, your parent club? It's, it's, it's difficult because, yeah, you, you think, oh, I can stay here, get my chance, and you're getting a sniff. And then it, with football, things change quickly. Do you know what I mean? Transfer windows come, new players come in, and now it's like, okay, yeah, now I need to go somewhere where I'm going to have more opportunity to play kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? And then quickly realising football, people say certain things and it doesn't always work out to be how they say and um, long moves obviously can be difficult. It, it's like a it's a flip of the coin which way it can go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what What would you say has been your 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 best loan, and why do you think that was your best loan? Um, I think definitely when I was at Oxford, I think just because I had a coach there in Carl Robinson, who was from Liverpool, who had seen me play a lot when I was a kid, knew what I was about as a person, and um, Gabe just had that belief in me and just said to me, go on the pitch and just be free and do what you know you can do. You know what I mean? So definitely working with him was um, very good for me and definitely hope I can work with him again in the future. Yeah, for, for him, I, I don't know what he has. Obviously, you know way more than I do, but 
He yeah. just has a knack for young, talented players. Mm. And he gets the best out of them. Yeah. Why do you think that is? And um, how did his style of play help you? I wouldn't even say the style always helped me because when we, when I was there, we when I started there, we were um, weren't doing well in the league, and sometimes it was just going into games and getting points, and um, sometimes it didn't even suit the way I wanted to play. But he just he's very he's a very good man manager. He will come to you and he'll speak to you. You know that with him, he has that certain belief in you, do you know what I mean? He will tell you straight up, I, I believe in you, like, do you know what I mean? And he will make you feel comfortable when you go on the pitch to go and do um, what you can do. And even if it doesn't work out, he'll still come and speak to you and, and tell you certain things and work with you. And with him, you don't feel like there's it's pressure. You obviously put pressure on yourself as a player, but you you know that you've got someone in the dugout that's behind you and you make he makes you want to play for him, whereas a lot of managers, a lot of managers can be the opposite of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, so, so adding on to that, um, how he made you feel and, you know, his belief in you, um, adding two more things um, in terms of how you play and how you are as a person, what are two more things adding on to the manager's faith in you um, which allows you to play to the best of your ability? Um, I think... Obviously, alongside having somebody in the dugout that you you know is um positive, believes in you, etc. Just your mentality, um, in terms of like I said, being free and stuff. But with football, you'll know, especially being an attacker, confidence is everything. Confidence determines whether a player looks mediocre or even terrible to looking like the best player on the pitch. His confidence will be the differentiating factor. Do you know what I mean? in terms of the way he plays and what he can do on the pitch. So um, for me, working on my finishing and lots of repetitions after training or just on my own, just with a bag of balls, just getting my repetition and techniques and um, doing things so you don't have to think about it, you know what I mean? Just automating certain techniques and things like that. That gives you that confidence in your ability, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think little things like that and staying on top of how you feel just doing these things where you're just doing a lot of repetitions, it just makes you feel good. Do you know what I mean? And then you'll find that when you go on a pitch, you'll do things um, without even thinking about it. So yeah, I'd definitely say um, that little bit of extra work. It may only be 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes after a session or whatever, um, for, especially for attacking players, it's huge. So um, obviously your time at Oxford was, was, was a good one. Um, did you feel like at the time, you know, if I stayed longer, maybe who knows what could have happened. You know, you could have ended up... Was it finishing the season with them or renewing? No, I, did, um, I did finish the season with them. Um, and then the next season, I had obviously the option to go back, but I obviously choose, chose to step to go abroad. Um, but yeah, obviously, obviously hindsight is a beautiful hindsight, thing. Hindsight, hindsight, hindsight. Yeah. People always say, um, maybe... Could have done things differently, but um, still speak to obviously uh, Robo at, at times, and definitely, hopefully, that's a door that may may still be open. You never know. Sounds interesting. Sounds interesting. So, um, obviously, uh, quarantine has hit, and um, obviously during this time, it, it's kind of you know stopped a lot of people in your in their momentum. Uh, now the season's finished. Uh, what would you say is the plan for the future, and um, what kind of things have you learned from all of your experience? Because you've got a ton of experience for still a young player. Um, yeah. yeah. Think, um, well, in terms of my experience, I think um, as, a, as a footballer and as a young player, you, you have to, um, you get yourself so emotionally invested in every little thing do you know what I mean? To do with the game within your performance, and you players will notice you. It affects you so much emotionally, whether things go well or whether they don't go well. And I think as a player, you have to you have to maintain that like attention to detail um, in terms of your preparation, your performance, and everything. But you can't let it affect you emotionally. Um, 
as much as I used to do as a young player because with football you'll find that if you do that emotionally you'll just be like this like all the time and you'll be too low at some points and then if you can't let yourself get too high at certain points do you know what I mean so definitely just um emotionally kind of keeping yourself in check obviously you, you care about everything that's going on but you can't let it let things get to you so much that would probably be a big piece of advice and then probably for me next obviously with everything that's going on um, it's a bit difficult, you know, um, speaking to Watford, they don't 100% know how the season's going to be concluded, not 100% sure whether there'll be a Premier League or Championship team next season. And obviously, I think that will have a, a big impact on what I do next season, do you know what I mean? So it's a little bit up in the air right now, but there's um, obviously quite a few options. So it's just um, a matter of waiting, really, to see how things pan out and then making a decision from there. For players wanting to go abroad, um and they're not sure on their experience what advice would you give them and what things to look out for and um yeah what kind of advice would you give them um i definitely say if you get the opportunity to do it because um in players english players especially in england you get caught up in the fact that yeah everybody sees uh, england as the pinnacle mm. it does mean it's great when you're there and if you can get in and you're playing regularly at top level, it's going to be unbelievable and you're, you're at the pinnacle. But at the same time, everybody around the world sees it as the same and everybody wants to come. So opportunities do become few and far between. You'll, I'm 100% sure like you'll be able to sit here now and name five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten players that you know that are capable and can play at the level, at the top level that you, you feel they could do that in the Premier League but just because of the fact that they're English or being in England um, for such a long time just haven't gotten the opportunity do you know what I mean but you fully think that and anybody around them fully thinks that they are capable do you know what I mean yeah um, going abroad there's, a, there's, there's definitely a lot of opportunities so if you do get a chance I definitely say for for um, players to definitely seriously consider it thanks for coming on um and, and thanks for being honest man obviously um you know your 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 career so far has been a, a very experienced one a very traveled one um a lot of managers a lot of players um a lot of wisdom for a young player as well you know um some people they don't get the experiences that you 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 have got and um that will you know that will carry a long way for you um leading up into the next part of your career um i feel like um with you you have the talent to go to the top uh, i think it's just down to opportunities and like you said um playing in your natural state whether that be um you know you you have the the background around you maybe if it's closer to home or maybe if it's like uh you know situational with uh the club at the time but if all of those things mesh together, I feel like um, you you have the capabilities of of going to the top. And we're all young, so there's still a lot of time left. Um, and yeah, I would just like to say thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for being honest, and hopefully we can do this again, bro. Definitely, bro, man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. For more content like this, like, share, and subscribe.